Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 17352 in the name of Mary Fee on SAMH report on universal credit and mental health. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate, please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Mary Fee to open the debate. Ms Fee, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our social security system should be available to all in times of need. It should guarantee a level of economic safety and assistance to those who cannot work, those who find themselves out of work, or those struggling to make ends meet. Instead, under a, a cruel and unfeeling Tory government, it offers neither safety nor assistance. The SAMH report on universal credit and mental health is a significant in insight to help us understand what is happening to the very people the social security system was designed to protect. And can I thank all of my MSP colleagues for signing the motion, allowing us to have this debate this evening. The issues raised in the report are not party political. They are the concerns and fears of many people with poor mental health. My sincere thanks go to Sam H and those behind the case studies discussed in their report. With their valuable input, the human impact of universal credit implementation is made very clear. The motion on the SAMH report gives a brief summary. One tells us clearly that universal credit is creating new and additional barriers for people with poor mental health. These barriers include digital by default, the work capability assessment, the payment period and the sanction regime. All barriers leaving people with more stress, with more anxiety and more pressure on their mental health. And rightly, we want people who are able to work to do so. However, any system that pushes people further from, from employment isn't a service that's fit for purpose. And there are a number of recommendations to change the system. And the single recommendation which is aimed at the Scottish Government is one that I hope the Minister will respond to later. And presiding officer, Sam H tells us that they welcome the principles behind universal credit to simplify the complex UK social security system. And that unfortunately for many people, the aims of the changes have been undermined through its structure and its delivery. And the first recommendation calls for the scrapping of the policy of digital by default. The Scottish Household Survey found that only two thirds of households with incomes of less than 15,000 per year have internet access. Citizens Advice Scotland found that 68% of people seeking to claim a disability benefit require assistance to make a claim online. And research by the DWP found that 24% of people with long-term conditions could not register a claim online, that 53% needed support to set up a claim, and that 38% of claimants need ongoing support. That is a burden for many, particularly those with disabilities and mental health problems. As telephone applications for universal credit are limited and claimants must evidence that they are digitally excluded. And of course, for some libraries are an option. However, with many libraries closing or restricting hours in recent years, coupled with the mental health of claimants, applying online is an extremely difficult barrier to overcome. And presiding officer, Sam H highlights that the work capability assessment does not work for people with mental health problems. The assessors cannot adequately judge the mental health of claimants because they lack a full understanding of the wide range of mental health conditions and how these can impact on job searching and the ability to work. And while waiting for assessment, claimants may be required to undertake work-related activities and job searching. And Sam H report that this can be as much as 35 hours of job searching per week. And if they don't do that, they can be threatened with sanctions. And that is quite simply unjust and unfair on people with complex mental health problems, especially if those mental health problems are coupled with physical problems. And delays to assessments and lengthy waits can cause further distress and further anxiety. And in June 2018, 
the median wait time for applying for universal credit and a final decision was 15 weeks. And the report paints a very clear picture that the process of applying for universal credit is flawed. The process of managing the claim provides even more barriers for people with mental health problems. The first payment comes after five weeks and is believed to be a deliberate choice by the DWP. And I fully support the SAMH recommendation that the five week waiting period, period is unjustified and should be abolished. Citizens Advice Scotland found that in areas where universal credit has been fully rolled out, there has been a 15% rise in rent arrears, an 87% increase in crisis grant awards, and rises of 40% and 70% of advice for food banks in two areas. People with mental health problems should not have to face increasing poverty and debt. The report tells us that 86% of people with mental health problems believe their financial situation influences heavily on their mental health. The social security system should not be designed to put people into debt and into poverty. Even with advanced payments, financial problems are worsened because they are loans. And it is sickening that those in the most desperate need are pushed further into financial hardship. And there is absolutely no morality in that. And, presiding officer, I could spend the rest of the evening going through the many, many informative recommendations and conclusions of the SAMH report and how people with mental health problems are being let down by a system that should be supporting them. But in the time left, I want to discuss the section of the report on Scottish flexibilities. And the recommendation from this report is one that I hope the Scottish Government can make progress on, and I hope to hear more from the Minister on this. With aspects of the delivery of universal credit devolved, such as the frequency of payment, the ability to pay housing element of universal credit to a landlord, and the ability to split payments between members of a household. Sam H welcome these choices, going on to, to comment that the choices will assist people in managing their money to avoid further financial hardship. However, the report calls on the DWP and the Scottish Government to work together to urgently correct issues over the delivery of the Scottish choices, to provide assurances to claimants and to landlords. People with mental health problems need assurances that these choices will in no way impact on their mental health. The SAMH report tells us that the administration of Scottish choices has caused problems for social landlords because the payments to landlords are made in arrears and do not match the monthly schedule for payments to claimants. And I hope that no person with mental health problems has caused unnecessary stress and anxiety because of these administrative problems. And finally, presiding officer, I want to thank Sam H and the individuals involved in the case studies for their informative and valuable report. And due to the volume of information contained in the report, I have not been able to reflect on information directly from the case studies. However, if they are listening to this debate tonight, my message to them is that I hear them and I will be in their corner and all those who find themselves in the social security system. We need a system that respects people throughout their claim and into work. One that provides security and assistance, especially for people with mental health problems and physical disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Elaine Smith, who will be followed by Bill Kidd. Ms Smith. Thank you very much, presiding officer, and thank you for calling me so early on in the debate as I may have to leave before uh, the final speeches and apologies to the Chamber and to Mary Fee for that. Can I also thank Mary Fee for bringing the issue to the Chamber today, particularly as I know that most of us will have assisted constituents who are suffering under universal credit and want to see this unfair system and the way it's working just now being challenged. Thanks are also due to Scottish Association for Mental Health for the work they've done in highlighting the effect of universal credit and the processes involved in claiming it on the mental health of claimants. And Citizens Advice Bureau as well should have a mention for the work that they've done. This reveals yet another aspect of welfare reform. It's been poorly planned, it's been badly implemented and it penalises the most vulnerable in society. And as the motion notes, the universal credit system has created new barriers and it's added pressures for people with mental health problems. 
And it's not that long since we actually begun to consider, it's shockingly it's not that long since we began to consider uh, mental health to be of the same importance as physical health. So it's unacceptable that our social security system is now actively contributing to mental health problems. Being assessed for an entitlement causes anxiety um, for, for any claimants, but the impact on those with mental health problems is particularly harsh. And one of the most harmful aspects of the application process is the work capability assessment. Sam H's report notes that the median time from application to final decision following a work capability assessment is 15 weeks. But there are cases where that has been significantly longer. So it's easy to see the distress and anxiety that that kind of time scale is going to cause for some of the most vulnerable claimants. Another issue mentioned by Mary Fee is the online application process, which can cause further stress and anxiety, and, it, and particularly for those with no easy access to the internet. And uh, Mary Fee outlined the, the figures on that. But actually, the report itself shows that the DWP itself has found that 24% of people with long-term conditions were not able to register for Universal Credit Online. Presiding officer, a society can be judged by how it treats its vulnerable citizens, and the UK should be judged harshly for implementing a reform system which piles anxiety onto those with existing health issues. There's no doubt about that. Last week, Professor Philip Alston, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, released his final report, as we know, about his visit to the UK. He concluded that much of the glue that has held British society together since the Second World War has been deliberately removed and replaced with a harsh and uncaring ethos. He also highlighted personal stories um, that he heard, which matched the growing body of research, like Sam H's report, about the negative impact of universal credit on mental health. One of Sam H's recommendations is that the DWP publish sanction statistics disaggregated by disability and medical condition. However, the report quotes the Sam H service user also saying, the fear of being sanctioned is enough to ruin your life without actually being sanctioned. So of course we need those figures, but we must also bear that in mind that fear itself can take a toll on people's health. And there's no evidence that benefit sanctions for people with mental health issues incentivise employment. I'm not sure they incentivise them for anyone, but there's certainly no evidence for people with mental ill health. However, there is compelling evidence that what they do is take a toll on mental and physical health because we need to re-emphasise that a mental health problem doesn't only manifest itself as a mental health problem, it affects physical health to a point made by my colleague Mary Fee. Another final point that I want to highlight is the inadequate collection of data with regard to eligible claimants. If we don't know who's entitled to receive universal credit, how can we then best ensure that everyone eligible does receive it? This was recently highlighted by the Resolution Foundation. And it would be interesting to hear from the Minister, although I may not be here personally to hear it, but it would be interesting to know how the Scottish Government intends to increase uptake amongst particularly vulnerable groups, including those with mental health difficulties. As the motion states, social security should exist as a safety net for the people of Scotland. It should not make them poorer or more disadvantaged, and it certainly shouldn't make claimants' health suffer due to the stress and anxiety the system causes. The Sam H report, with the examples in it, reveal yet another aspect of universal credit which is not fit for purpose, penalises the vulnerable, and discourages application, and which needs reformed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Bill Kidd to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Mr Kidd, please. Thank you very much, President Officer, and thanks, of course, to Mary Fee for bringing this serious concern to the Chamber. I welcome the report from Sam H. Uh, details the ways in which universal credit does not accommodate the needs of people with mental health problems. Beyond this, the report accounts how the numerous changes to welfare are exacerbating pressures on a vulnerable group of people, in some cases worsening the mental health problems they face. Today, we can also debate in the context of Professor Philip Olson, the UN Rapporteur, having published his final report on poverty and the impact of universal credit in the UK, the initial findings of which are referenced by Sam H. Over past weeks, we have all seen the headlines and articles following this damning report on the extent of poverty. We have also seen the UK government's response of shrugged shoulders and Amber Rudd's point blank denial of the report findings. And the official DWP response was to imply that the report was unrepresentative and said that if the rapporteur had spent more time in the UK, one of the 
wealthiest and happiest countries in the world, that it is likely Olsen would have reached a different conclusion. The trouble with this denial is that it reveals a disconnection with the reality of poverty. Rudd's response to the United Nations findings betrays an unbelievably disconnected thought process that somehow those living in comparative wealth negates the levels of destitution or extreme poverty in the UK. How else could her representative suggest that a longer stay in the UK and exposure to different groups would change UN conclusions drawn in reaction to extreme poverty? Presiding officer, the poverty still exists. And my SNP colleagues and I, indeed the majority of elected representatives in this parliament, see that the UN report findings are not false. And I believe that the UN and Sam H reports have lain bare the daily struggles and injustices experienced by the poorest in society. I also believe that the poorest are not there by their own fault or poor money management, but that we live in a country where there are huge amounts of inherited wealth and also inherited poverty, making it harder for people to move out of that poverty that they have been born into. Over the past six years, we have seen universal credit come to life, if we can call it that, under the Tories. This follows years of austerity and the benefits freeze. The implementation of universal credit has been accompanied by a rise in the number of food banks across the UK. This includes, in my constituency, uh, four months after the rollout of un universal credit in Drumchapel, we saw another food bank open. Sam H has shown in their report that the delays in digitalization, as mentioned uh, by Mary Fee and by Elaine Smith, of universal credit have caused significant stress to recipients already struggling with mental health issues. We live in a prosperous, innovative and culturally rich nation. The most dramatic inequality in society today, today is the extremity of wealth inequality. It is our responsibility to those faced with the hardship of poverty and the often related mental health issues to re recognise our ability as elected representatives to tackle this poverty head on. I'm proud to represent a party and a parliament that have used the powers available to prioritise tackling child poverty. In fact, Professor Olson described the new social security system as an ambitious scheme that is guided by the principles of dignity and social security as a human right. Scotland has worked hard to nurture the lowest levels of poverty in the UK, but unlike some voices in Westminster, I will not say that profound poverty does not still exist because it does. By tackling the injustice that is poverty, we can create a situation where people are treated as they should always be, with value and with dignity. And that should be our goal at all times. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Alison Johnson. Ms. Johnson will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms. Ballantyne, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Dealing with, dealing with life when you are suffering from poor mental health is a challenge, even when things are going well and you have all the support you need. I know from my nursing and psychiatric experience how mental health impacts on an individual's ability to deal with stressful situations, and navigating the maze of benefits will never be anything but demanding. For nine years, I headed up the drug and alcohol unit, and many of my most vulnerable clients struggled with benefits and the lack of support that used to be the hallmark of job centres. It was left to voluntary agencies to get them both financial assistance and opportunities to enter the job market. And alongside others, Sam H was one of the agencies that provided excellent support in the borders. Sadly, however, they have had to close their doors in Gala Shields. The arrival of Universal Credit has seen major changes to the manner in which benefits are delivered, but also in the way clients are supported in accessing help. Sam H's report explores some of the challenges and recognises the barriers that people with mental health issues may face. It is an effective overview of those challenges, and they make some good recommendations. Nonetheless, it is essential to recognise that the supporting evidence for the report predates many of the changes that are being trialled or have already been implemented, implemented during 2018 and 2019. A lot of work has also gone into ensuring that job centres are welcoming with carefully designed layouts that minimise the stress that individuals experience. All de departmental staff working with claimants now complete extensive training that prepares them for their role. Specific training is provided for working with different vulnerable groups, including claimants with mental health conditions. 
An enhanced mental health training package has already been delivered to 19,755 staff with plans already developed for, a for delivery to a further 34,000 staff across a number of directorates. Following a review of the delivery of training in 2018-19 and working with stakeholders, including work psychologists, further enhancements have been made to learning and development material, which has been tested as part of the test and learn phase prior to national rollout from June 2019. The DWP has also announced earlier this year that claimants with mental health problems would be fast-tracked to support from the job centre. Medical experts will be stationed in job centres to give on-the-spot assessments and will have power to refer people for treatment. This new approach is being trialled in a joint venture by the NHS and the DWP in Buckinghamshire and Milton Keynes. If successful, it will be rolled out across the UK. Nearer to home, the DWP are trialling a virtual reality job centre in Glasgow to help those with autism or heightened sensory awareness to feel comfortable accessing a job centre. Citizens Advice are now providing help to claim, which will support vulnerable claimants to ensure that they can navigate their entitlements and successfully apply. Whilst all claimants, including those with mental health conditions, receive continuous tailored support through their personal work coach. I hope colleagues across the chamber will welcome these developments and I hope Sam H will be watching them closely and report on their success in their next report. I think it is incumbent on all of us to ensure that any services we provide are accessible and usable by all claimants. And those with mental health do need extra support and they do need extra services. And I, for one, am glad that people are taking notice of this and are working to make sure that they get what they need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ballantyne. I call Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> Our social security system should do what it says on the tin. It should be there for all of us when we need it to provide support and security. But too often, it does the opposite. It can foster insecurity, anxiety, and as the title of the report we're debating today acknowledges, confusion. Now, this is bad enough for anyone, but it's particularly a concern for people experiencing mental health conditions. Universal credit increases the scope of benefit sanctions without any strong evidence that such sanctions work. And um, as Elaine Smith noted, there is clear evidence that they can do much harm, especially for people with mental health conditions. A five-year research project, a collaboration between six universities examining sanctions, found that the application of welfare conditionality exacerbates many disabled people's existing illnesses and impairments, and its detrimental impact on those with mental health issues is a particular concern. For mental health issues to be taken into account in the claimant commitment, they need to be disclosed. But the Sam H report tells us that the need for disclosure is a significant source of distress for people with mental health conditions who may not have the confidence to discuss their mental health on the first meeting with a work coach. And when mental health conditions are disclosed, it's not clear that work coaches are able to provide the necessary support. The DWP's own research found that work coaches felt overwhelmed by the number of claimants with health conditions and lacked the time and training to, to confidently identify vulnerable claimants. And it's also worth noting that in contrast to the old system, conditionality can be imposed before health assessments are conducted. It's therefore possible that someone might be subject to conditionality and therefore sanctions while waiting for an assessment that will later exempt them from conditionality. So essentially assumed guilty until proven innocent. Now, I was particularly proud to stand on a manifesto commitment to ensure devolved employment programmes are entirely free from sanctions and even prouder to see this implemented by the Scottish Government. The report we're discussing also makes clear the work capability assessments that are part of universal credit don't work for people with mental health conditions. As the Sam H report says, the assessments don't capture the impact of mental health and other fluctuating conditions, and assessors aren't always aware of how mental health conditions impact on ability to work. And the WCA can make mental health conditions even more severe. A study from Heriot Watt and Stirling University with 30 Scots claimants found that the WC experience for many caused a deterioration in people's mental health, which individuals did not recover from. 
In the worst cases, the WC experience led to thoughts of suicide. Now, this is made even worse by the fact that the WCA is, as the DWP admits, one of the major reasons for late payments, which disproportionately impact people with mental health conditions and leaves people months on end without certainty as when they'll get their full amount and what it will be. So that itself has an impact on mental health. That would concern anyone. Colleagues will have had experience, as have I, of helping constituents who are worried about the WC assessment. In many cases, it takes representations from MSPs, MPs and welfare rights experts for pre-existing evidence to be considered properly and assessments which are a risk to health to be cancelled. Now, the report relates to UK universal credit, but there are clearly lessons to be learned for the new Scottish system, as a large number of people will be receiving a Scottish devolved payment in respect of a mental health condition. We've made a good start as a result of a Green Amendment. The face-to-face -face assessments that cause so much stress will be banned unless it is the only way evidence can, can be found or unless the person requests one. But we need to do more. I hope to see all Social Security Scotland staff interacting who are interacting with applicants, receiving the training they need um, so that they understand how their work can impact on people with mental health conditions. Um, in conclusion, presiding officer, the assessment criteria for disability assistant, assistance must recognise that the introduction of PIP has meant that more than 50% of those receiving DLE for the two most common mental health conditions have either been denied PIP or given a reduced award. Um, I'd like to thank Mary Fee for bringing this important debate to the Chamber and I hope it urges both the Scottish Government and the UK Government to put respect for mental health at the heart of the, the reserved and the devolved social security systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Johnson. I call on Shirley Ann Summerall to close with the Government. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd also like to thank Mary Fee for bringing this important matter to debate today in the Chamber. She said during her opening remarks that social security should be available to all in times of need, but that the current system neither provides safety or assistance. Um, I couldn't agree more with that, presiding officer. Um, it is sad, uh, but so very true that the current system uh, does not do that. The Scottish Association for Mental Health report into the impact of universal credit on people with mental health problems makes for very stark reading. It clearly shows that universal credit is causing hardship and emotional distress for people with mental health problems and rightly makes several recommendations for change. This report adds to the growing evidence and to similar reports from other organisations about the impact of universal credit that it is having on people who are forced to rely on it. And I'd like to tackle some of the issues that the report raises with universal credit, though, as we know, the list is far longer than I have time for this evening. The minimum five-week wait for the first payment is simply not acceptable, especially when there is no guarantee of the correct payment at the end of that five-week wait. And indeed, Mary Fee rightly pointed out how long people um, have to actually wait in reality. It is much longer than that minimum five-week wait for many. Many people are therefore left with little option but to take up the DWP's offer of an advance payment leaving them in debt right from the very start of their claim as they are required to pay that back at a rate of up to 40% of their standard allowance each month. This has had a damaging impact both on the levels of debt that an individual is under and of course understandably on their mental health as well. The punitive sanctions regime that underpins universal credit has been mentioned by many speakers tonight and is causing profound anxiety and stress for many people. There is mounting evidence, and Alison Johnson reported, uh, discussed it, the recent five-year study on this, but uh, there is mounting evidence that the current approach to sanctions and conditionality is not only ineffective, but it is having an exceptionally damaging effect on people's health and well-being as well, of course, as pushing them further into poverty. Other examples which, of course, have came up during the debate uh, mentioned by Elaine Smith and Mary Fee are, of course, around the work capability assessments. They quite rightly pointed out the concerns around that. And the digital by default. There can be nobody in this chamber who hasn't had heartbreaking constituency cases of individuals who come to their surgeries that have no access to a computer, no access to an email, no access to a mobile, 
and therefore no chance to apply, never mind to keep their journal up to date um, themselves. Um, I am particularly struck, I'm sure others will be, by the individuals who we have attempted to assist during this process, uh, but it is simply unacceptable that people are put in such a distressing um, position in the first place. Samich also recommends that nobody is transferred over to universal credit through the processes of either natural or managed migration. And the Scottish Government has repeatedly called on the UK Government to stop this from happening while the system is so clearly unable to cope and is unfit for purpose. It is surely unacceptable that anyone should be forced to claim universal credit when it simply can't provide them with the support that they require. Presiding officer, we have raised these points and more with the UK government countless times over the last few years. We know that universal credit is not fit for purpose and yet still people are forced to rely on this broken system. The report rightfully uh, recommended that the Scottish government work with the DWP to overcome the administrative issues with the delivery of Scottish choices. And I recognise that the DWP's existent payment scheduling process for direct payments to social landlords used for the UC Scottish choices can make it difficult for landlords to accurately manage their income. Now, while the policy on uh, direct payments to landlords is devolved, the systems do sit solely with the DWP. Only they can make changes to the system itself. And we have repeatedly called uh, for the DWP uh, to move on this issue. I am pleased to say that they have now confirmed that they will develop a replacement method of payment by the end of 2019. And I hope this does alleviate the concerns of uh, social landlords uh, and their tenants and that this will ensure that under Scottish choices, landlords will be paid on the same day as their tenant. Now, I have spoken about the Samich report, adding to the growing evidence that universal credit isn't working. Last week, that mountain of evidence grew further as the, U the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Professor Philip Alston, published his final and damning report following his visit to the UK last year. It is exceptionally hard-hitting and makes for a very sobering read. Its conclusions have been mentioned by Elaine Smith, Bill Kidd um, and others, and rightly so. Professor Alston was particularly scathing of universal credit, criticising indeed many of the same problems that the Samich report has raised. And I know Michelle Ballantyne was trying to reassure the Chamber that a lot of work has been taken place that perhaps the Samich report didn't take account of. The, Uni the United Nations Rapporteur's report uh, would certainly be aware of all of that and it would be fair to say, presiding officer, he is far from convinced on that argument. Now, the Scottish approach to the 11 benefits that we will take responsibility for on April 2020 could not be more different to that approach th that we have seen with universal credit. We are building a system with people. We are listening to their experiences of the problems with the UK system to ensure we deliver a service that meets the needs of the people of Scotland. We do see um, social security as a human right and an investment in the people of Scotland. Our system will be an inclusive one and an accessible one and we will remove the barriers for people, not put them in the way. There were a number of particular points that um, other members picked up during um, the debate. Elaine Smith, for example, spoke about the requirement for uh, the Scottish Government to improve the take-up of uh, benefits. And of course, she will be um, aware that we are um, obligated indeed uh, to do so uh, through the Social Security Act. And we will be developing the take-up strategy that's due for publication this autumn. It's not just because it's in this legislation, but quite frankly, presiding officer, it's the right thing to do to ensure that those who are eligible are encouraged and supported to take up their eligibility. I also want to, to pick up one other point that Michelle Ballantyne raised about a, a good idea, some good practice that the DWP is, is bringing up, and that's the virtual job centre. Now, that may indeed work for some of the people that are using it. I say with the greatest respect to Michelle Ballantyne, you have to have a real job centre to go to after that. And the closure that's been undertaken in Glasgow and in other areas of job centres that again is making it more increasingly difficult for people to be able to access what they are eligible for is putting again extreme hardship and distress on many. Virtual job centres just don't cut it, I'm afraid, presiding officer. 
Alison Johnson also mentioned the aspect of training staff for Social Security Scotland. Um, and I, I'd absolutely reassure her that that is something that myself and, of course, the agency is taking very seriously, not just about mental health, but on all issues to ensure that everyone, not just client advisors, but everyone who works for Social Security Scotland has an understanding of the barriers that people may face um, and some of the challenges that people will face again and even approaching or thinking about approaching the agency and it's going forward and I will of course keep the committee um, of which Alison Johnson is a member fully updated on our work on this issue. In closing, presiding officer, I'd like to uh, conclude by quoting the report itself which said that the structural issues with universal credit are direct obstacles to people with mental health problems accessing essential support and financial security. I couldn't agree more and I fully support the motion today and urge the UK government to consider this report very, very carefully along with the countless others and their findings and finally, finally to make the changes that are so desperately required to universal credit. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.